Roy Mustang from Hiromu Arakawa's Full Metal Alchemist is one of my favorite characters ever written. Not only is he endlessly magnetic, incredibly cool, dangerously relatable, and devastatingly emotional, but the guy is what I think one of the best written characters that anime and manga really have to offer. And even though I love and appreciate and enjoy and cry at his character arc, I think the way said character arc is presented to the audience is even more brilliant. Like, look, if I was hired to teach a college course about how to write brilliant characters that feel like real people and the audience will, you know, connect to, I would probably assign focus on Roy Mustang, which is pretty much what I'm about to do. So, I am Wyatt the Word Weaver, and let's see how Roy Mustang was woven into one of the greatest characters ever written. Now, there's a lot of little factors that make Mustang a really cool character, and we'll go over those, but I really want to focus today on three main characteristics that make him a great character and these three characters just kind of cover everything else and those are character complexity pacing and emotional weight all right character complexity what is it why is it important Character complexity is a factor by which many characters are judged and complimented. If you've ever heard a critic refer to a character as three-dimensional or multifaceted or like a real person, they're, you know, complimenting said character's complexity of personality. It means the character's not one note. You can't sum them up in a few sentences. They have a complex moral system and perhaps even are a bit hypocritical. They generally exist in some sort of moral ambiguity and sometimes they will act irrationally because of personal and emotional damage or baggage and pretty much every like really really popular character of the last few years has been described this way. One of the things that defines Mustang is that he is an adult which contrasts him heavily with series protagonist Edward Elric. Edward is a child, and thus a few episodes or chapters into the story, we fully understand his backstory, his goals, and his motivations. Edward is made a more complex character as he grows and changes on his way to adulthood throughout the series. Not so with Mustang. Mustang has a much longer, complicated, and more involved past. It's one that the audience isn't clued into until he's had quite a lot of screen time. And over the course of his arc, we'll find that Mustang's past is something that is both a source of strength and a prison that binds him. So Mustang has a lot of different sides to his character, which we will go into later. But for me, it's the order and timing in which these facets are revealed to the audience that really make him a superbly written character. And that is what I mean when I talk about our second big thing pacing. Pacing is what really takes Mustang's arc into being one of the best in manga and anime. So let's go through every facet of Mustang's personality and let's see how said pacing and said personality facets pull this off. Before Mustang's proper introduction to the audience, he has a little bit of a mini introduction, but he leaves as quickly as he comes, says a few nebulous lines, and the camera doesn't even focus on him. He stays mysterious. No, Mustang's proper introduction is far more dramatic. After the Elrics and co. spend a, an entire episode trying desperately to take down this one villain, Mustang finishes him in a single snap of his fingers. And this is the first aspect of Mustang that has introduced to the audience. He is a cunning tactician and a overwhelmingly powerful, cold, hard, badass. This makes him incredibly magnetic. From his sharp character design to his signature fighting style, Mustang is one of the most iconic characters in shonen history. Throughout the show, Mustang is given many heart-stopping combat sequences, as well as one of the most badass, amazing fight scenes ever drawn. Animated by Yutaka Nakamura, the Lust vs. Mustang fight would go down as one of the coolest things to ever happen. The sheer bravery, combat power, and tactical ability of this character is going to attract him to the audience. 
Between his overwhelming combat ability and his talent for manipulation, Mustang is a clear step up in power when he's introduced from anyone we've seen so far. This is the first aspect of Mustang's character. But then we settle in and we spend some time with Mustang and we find out that instead of being a cold soldier, Mustang instead has actually a pretty huge goofy side. Travis Willingham delivers the tiny mini skirts line with perfect comedic weight and Mustang gets plenty of repeated gags over the course of the show. He is surrounded by a vibrant cast of comedic characters with chemistry so perfect that the original show made a filler episode that's just those guys you know doing side adventures and wandering around and it's honestly one of the most entertaining episodes of that anime the comedic side humanizes mustang it makes him more into a person you like to grab a beer with and it's just when we start to settle in and think of mustang and his hodgepodge family as friends that we start to learn about his past. After numerous hints, we began to learn the extent of Mustang's tour in the Ishvalan War, the things he did there, where the line between necessary orders and war crime blurred and obscured. We get to know a man who sees the eyes of cowering children and his comrades, who can't sleep at night because he's haunted by the smell of burnt corpses. A man who is tempted to commit the greatest of sins to wash the blood from his hands. A man who drinks alone in his room to forget the screams of civilians, and a man who eventually puts a gun in his mouth. It's a devastating portrayal of a man haunted by war and PTSD, but it wouldn't be nearly as effective if we hadn't already gotten to know and respect Mustang as a character. That is what I mean by the power of pacing. If we hadn't seen him be so strong, it wouldn't be so devastating to see him weak, and if we didn't already think of him as a friend, we wouldn't want to reach out and help him. It's a brilliant sequence of events from which we go to, oh, Mustang, to, <laughs> oh, Mustang, to, oh, Mustang. This is no accident. This is a deliberate act of writing brilliance. You bring the audience up so you can knock them down. And side note, that deliberate pacing for the beginning beats of Mustang's arc is actually missing from Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, and I think it's one of the weaker parts of the show. So those are the three initial facets of Mustang, his three dimensions, if you will. We have a powerful, tactical warrior, a goofy screwball with a love for his adopted family, and a damaged soldier trying to run from a past he can't escape. Now there are other aspects of Mustang's character I want to talk about later, but first I want to discuss that third thing we talked about at the beginning, emotional weight. I like the term emotional weight because it describes the effect that powerful emotions have on scenes in art. Emotions give stories power, they give them heft. Like, you may be watching completely made-up events represented by pixels on a screen, but if those pixels can make you feel something down inside, if they can emotionally affect you, then that makes them real, in a way, at least to you. Emotional power is the chance for fictional events to have impact on real people and the real world. Mustang carries a massive amount of emotional weight throughout FMA's run, but the way he carries said weight changes over its course. Now that sounds really complicated, but it's actually pretty simple in its execution, and it changes as those different emotional facets are introduced. The first three allow for the first way that Mustang will evoke emotion in his audience. Simple empathy. At this point, Mustang is a character we care about. We've been in awe of him and have been entertained by him. He has our allegiance. We think of him as a friend, and when that third facet rears its head, we see our friend in pain and we want to help. But then there's a massive shift, a major plot point that totally changes the events of the entire story. And that is the death of Maze Hughes. The death of Maze Hughes is one of my favorite events in anime because not only is it just heartbreakingly powerful, but it's also an impactful event that forces every member of our large roster of protagonists to deal with it and process said trauma in different ways. Maze is the funniest member of our cast, a constant ray of light even when things get really dark and with him dead it's kind of like, the joy is gone, time to get serious. 
The tragedy of that event is going to emotionally affect the audience. I know it emotionally affected me, and it hurts every character, but there is no one on the cast who feels that pain deeper than Roy Mustang. This fans the flame of the next aspect of Roy's character, one that's been there from the start, but is now front and center. Conviction. After May's death, Mustang makes this big speech about how he's going to become the fearer at any cost to avenge May's death and make the crimes committed in Nishval right somehow. He lets the trauma of his past shape the course of his future, and because we have also been hurt by this fact, you know, we're, we're right behind him. We're like, yeah, come on, Mustang, you can do it. Take them all down. We want blood. This marks the second phase of our story as Mustang, the Elrics, and their team start to gather clues and flush out the conspiracy lying at the heart of the government. Several large explosive battles end in their favor and Mustang is leading the charge of all of us, a holy crusader willing to burn out the corruption rotting the heart of his country. This section of the story features that breathtaking Mustang versus Lust fight I mentioned earlier, and anyone who sees that is going to get behind Mustang as the ultimate hero. At this point, he is our guy. We are right behind Mustang as he puts together his team, gathers all the clues, and goes straight for the enemy's throat. But what Mustang finds is not redeeming victory. It's overwhelming defeat. In the end, Mustang is simply not strong enough to win, to accomplish his goals. His opponents are too powerful, his knowledge is incomplete, his team fails him, and he fails his team. The turn of the third season of Fullmetal Alchemist Brotherhood leads to defeat of our protagonists on every front, met by foes who possess not only overwhelming strength, but entrenchment of decades. And we learn that everything our characters have done have just been playing into their hands the whole time. Season 3 serves as a bit of a reset for the show, seeing the Elrics go off to train in the north and gather new allies. A way to reset and get stronger. But Mustang... Mustang's not allowed to do any of that. Mustang has to stew in his loss. And that is where we get the fifth element of Mustang's character humiliation and defeat. After his defeat, Mustang is viciously declawed. His cabinet is scattered across a mistress with his beloved Hawkeye being held hostage, essentially, by the terrifying homunculus pride. And he is put in a position where he has power, but it's fake power, and he can't really do anything to affect our villains. At the same time in our story, the Elrics travel north, and they meet a whole host of new characters and new allies, and characters like General Armstrong and the new Greed take Mustang's place in the show as chief badass. For the third and fourth seasons, audience members are naturally just going to think of Mustang less and less, simply because he's in the show less and less. He doesn't participate in battles, and he doesn't seem really important to the plot anymore. This represents the low point of audience interaction with Mustang. You see, drama is all about contrast, you know? And it's like, say your most basic stories, you have the ultimate good going up against the ultimate evil, right? Because the extremes, by their nature, make the opposites look even more extreme in turn. Juxtaposition is a powerful tool for making an impact and... Mustang's, you know, fade from the limelight makes his return so impactful it's almost jarring. After being betrayed as weak, ineffectual, and helpless, what's the first thing that Mustang does upon re-entering the scene in a combat role? He completely wipes out a crowd of enemies that were near totally threatening our main heroes. In fact, it's a little too easy. It's a dunk of ice water onto the audience. Mustang... Mustang is really overpowered when you think about it. To put it in video game terms, because I'm a massive nerd, Mustang's attacks have a near instant cast time, can deal damage from dozens of yards away, no cost, no recovery, deal AoE damage to structures, and can easily stun lock 
That's not fair, and so our reintroduction to Mustang carries a lot of relief and happiness, but with it some awe and maybe even a little dose of fear. This is where Mustang's association with emotional weight becomes purely masterful. We've been waiting for four seasons for this confrontation, for Mustang to finally get his hands on the bastard that killed his best friend. And the fight probably eventually made you really uncomfortable. In terms of raw content, the Lust fight and the Envy fight are actually very, very similar. Both of them aren't so much fights as they are slaughters. Mustang unloading attack after attack, not even giving his opponent the chance to counter. It isn't fair and it isn't clean. It's a stomping through and through, no matter how you look at it. But in the Lust fight, Mustang is our heroic champion, returning from the brink of death to overcome his opponent. And he is framed as such. Trumpets blare a triumphant revelry as he attacks. The camera shoots him straight on and we get this really brilliant, almost sexy look at his determined eyes and his powerful expression. Either that or he's crammed into one side of the frame, silhouetted at the power of his own attacks as he barks out one-liners. He's cool. He's the epitome of cool. But the MV fight? The MV fight is different. It starts out relatively innocuous. Well, if you can count Envy doing her best to piss off the audience, innocuous. Envy gloats at Mustang and the audience, reveling in the fact that they killed Hughes, and we're just like, <sighs> Mustang, tear this guy apart. And he does. Envy proves to be no match for Mustang's flames, and he is forced to retreat deep into the labyrinth. Going into the next episode, Envy is forced to hide like prey, desperately trying to keep away from an overpowering hunter. Instead of heroic backing music, the music is somber, and it's low in the mix, barely noticeable even. Mustang is drawn at these low, severe angles. Instead of this cocky mask, instead, his face is contorted in rage. A shadow is almost always covering his face, and his tone is harsher than harsh. The entire fight, he's hurling insults at Envy, going into painful and grotesque detail about wanting to boil out her eyes and sear out his tongue. It's awful. This fight goes on for a pretty long time. Long enough for the excitement to fade, long enough for the satisfaction to wear off, long enough for everyone to stop and think and feel. Mustang is such a charismatic character. For so long, he's commanded respect and humor and awe. We love him, and now we're forced with the facts that he's just going bad. And we're forced to watch. This fight goes on for so long. This chase, this beatdown, this utter stomping goes on for so long that we're forced with the undeniable conclusion that Mustang has been consumed by hate. We have to accept the fact that Mustang has developed his fifth character trait. He has become cruel. Up to the end of the show, Mustang is growing, and his character is being uncovered to the audience. But unlike every other character who more or less just improves over the course of the show, Mustang is the only character to be proven over and over again to the audience that he is much worse of a person than they originally assumed. Even Scar who is probably on paper worse than Mustang, looks better because, at this point, he is on his path to redemption, whereas Mustang has done nothing but go deeper and deeper to the dark side. Mustang gets less righteous the longer the show goes on, and this is important because, again, he carries a massive amount of audience sympathy and allegiance. In a way, doesn't seeing a person who we loved and respect take sadistic glee at maiming his opponent, well, doesn't that make us bad people too? And this calls into question everything we've learned. Maybe Mustang's always been this way. Maybe this was the way he was in Ishfall. We see his remorse after the battles, but perhaps during it he was just as savage and just as relentless. Has he always enjoyed hurting people? This is a perspective that I think every fan of the series needs to seriously consider. But I think that a closer look at the material might absolve Mustang, at least a little bit. 
I found in my life that a lot of the really hardest work of being an adult is dealing with pain. Especially if you're an adult who's dealt with the amount of trauma that Mustang has. Mustang is in pain, but he doesn't tell anyone about it. He is in pain from the beginning of the show towards pretty much near the end. From the second we see him as a character, he is a man who is haunted by death, who can't get the smell of burnt corpses out of his nose. Yet the entire time, he hasn't really talked to anyone about it. Instead, Mustang chooses to deal with this pain by secluding himself in his quarters, drowning himself in whiskey. And in this dangerous alone, Mustang wonders if his life is even worth living. The only person who is able to shake Mustang out of his funk is Maze. Maze went through that trauma with him. He was there. And he is the only person who Mustang trusts to pull him out of his own funk. In order to cope with a traumatic experience, in order to cope with pain, a lot of people need a thing called a support network. You probably know what this is. Hopefully you have one. A support network is a group of people who know what your problem is and are committed to dealing with that, even if it means doing things that you tell them that you don't want. There are people who are willing to look past your momentary well-being to look at the core of who you are and what you actually need. And, well, Mustang has a support network made up of one person, and it's a capable person. But then that person dies. Mustang takes the death of Hughes harder than any main character in the series. But instead of talking to other characters who are sharing that grief, instead of being with the family like, say, Winry or Ed does, Mustang bottles all of that pain up, just like he's always done. Mustang makes a vow. He takes all of the pain of Hughes' death and he bottles it all up into a desperate promise to take over the government and reform things, to make Ishval right. This grim determination fuels him. It keeps him focused. So focused that for a while he isn't really haunted by his past. For a while, it looks like he's fine. It looks like he's better than ever, stronger than ever. This is a defense mechanism, and it powers him, and it seems like a good thing. But like all defense mechanisms, it's cheap, and it's easy, and it's eventually unsustainable. And when Mustang's world comes crashing down around him, he is left lower than he's ever been. Mustang is left to stew in his despair, an irrelevant fool who never even stood a chance against what he was up against. And while he sits, that loss, that despair, they sit there. They harden and calcify until Mustang is left a man driven by not self-determination, but hate. The blindest and most destructive of all emotions. It is this hate that we're forced to look at when we see his struggle against and his torture of envy. This hate is abusive, it's irrational, it's cruel, it's dangerous, and if left unchecked, it will consume Mustang. And this knowledge prompts the intervention of best girl, Riza Hawkeye. Let's back up a bit. Mustang is in this predicament because he lost his support network, and that's a little bit weird, because more than any other character in the entire series, Mustang is associated with teamwork. From the beginning, one of the first things established about him is his ability to manipulate people, to move them around like pieces on a board. He's constantly surrounded by his loyal squad, all of which he has obvious affection for. Mustang is the fiber that connects most of the cast. He's the one who introduces the Elrics to most of their friends early on in the show. This man is surrounded by people. So why is he so alone? In order for you to have a support structure, people around you need to know that you need help. And despite the fact that Mustang is surrounded by a loving family, people who would probably drop everything and talk to him about his problems. Mustang never reaches out. He holds the line of rank, you know, telling himself that the leader must be strong, that he can't show weakness. The most egregious example of this, of course, is Riza Hawkeye, the one person who Mustang dares shows a little bit of emotion in front of. Riza is closer to Mustang than anyone else, and she shares with him the trauma of being an Ishfall. Hawkeye is actually the character in the show who is most associated with its theme of PTSD. 
She is the one who explains to Ed in surprisingly calm tones the sheer extent of what happened in Nishval. It's real horrors. Hawkeye lays out her trauma so calmly in this scene that it's clear to us that that woman we see grieving during the war has at this point bottled up her pain in a necessary coping mechanism to just function. But just like Mustang, her coping mechanism is unsustainable and Reza's soul atrophies, sliding closer and closer to the worst decision a person can make. She fights off this depression, at least in the short term, using another coping mechanism. Mustang himself. Mustang is the representation of Reza's hope. She thinks that he's so strong and so powerful that she puts all of her faith onto him to make things right. He's the only thing keeping her together. He comforted her during the war and afterwards acted as her guiding light. Intentionally or not, Mustang did serve as a support network for Hawkeye. And any time he is threatened, we can see Hawkeye collapse. She can't do anything without him. Without him, she has no hope. But Hawkeye strengthens over the course of this series. She bides her time and puts her faith in the colonel, even when he doesn't have any faith in himself. During the MV fight, she is the only one allowed to stay by his side, but when Mustang goes for the kill, he orders her to stay behind. Hawkeye sees the darkness growing in her commander and her loved one, and she knows that if he kills Envy, that it will consume him. She sees hate desecrating the man that she knows is the best this country has to offer. The man who kept her going when nothing else did. And so she puts a gun to his head. But it isn't the gun that stops Mustang. It isn't the berations of Scar and Edward. That won't work. There's only one thing that will break through to Mustang. And in that final moment, Hawkeye decides to commit an act of complete and utter intimacy. She lets down every barrier, every denial, and admits that when these events are over, she plans on taking her own life. She lets Mustang know her greatest burden and her darkest intention. Shocked by this revelation, Mustang is shaken to his core. In a final explosive blast, he releases all of his anger, exposing the broken man that lies underneath. The brokenness that's always lied underneath. And I I'm sorry if my delivery gets a little sketchy here. This is the part that just... This is the part that just breaks me, folks. Travis Willingham takes his performance to the height of the industry, as Mustang admits that he can't allow for Hawkeye to die, that he can't afford for her to not be by his side, that she's been the only thing that's been keeping him going, just as Mustang was the only thing keeping Hawkeye going. Broken out of his rage, Mustang reflects on how far he's fallen, before turning to do something he should have done a long time ago. Mustang locks his eyes at Hawkeye, and in that moment, the two characters reach a moment of pure intimacy. It's a moment they hadn't reached since they were just two broken soldiers looking at a massacre, when Riza asked Mustang to maim her in order to keep another massacre from happening. It's a connection that they bottled down, repressed behind rank and duty. And it's a connection that has finally come to its surface in its full beauty, and this is one of my favorite moments in all of anime. Because after all these years, these two people are finally together in a way that, even though they've always been close, they never have. They always had the chance to, but this is what it took for them to burn past their crimes and their sins and their self-hate and everything keeping them trapped in their own minds and finally connect with one another. In this moment, the two characters finally realize how much they need each other, and Mustang turns away from his hate and begins to lean on everyone else for support, and Hawkeye takes the role she's always been destined to take as the person who provides that support. This is, of course, symbolized perfectly when Mustang loses sight, and he must rely on Hawkeye to aim his attacks, with the two working together perfectly to take down Father. His character arc complete, our Mustang is much more happy, hopeful, and cheerful, and he's He's a man that's driven not out of the desire to desperately wash the blood from his hands, but a driven conviction to make things right, to make things better for people, because he cares about people. And who is lying in the bed next to him but the woman who made that all possible? That's the arc, but this video, which I recognize at this point is running a little long, is not just a paint-by-numbers retelling of Mustang's arc with a pinch of psychoanalysis thrown in. Plenty of people can do that. 
Here at the Why at the World Weaver channel, we want to look a little deeper. We want to look at writing. So let's go back to that emotional weight. Hiromu Arakawa is clearly a master of manipulating her readers' emotions. Mustang's arc takes us to places that most mainstream fiction would never go. We are gifted the experience of seeing a person that we love and care for be the bad guy. He lets us down. He betrays us. This is important because not only should art strive to make its consumers feel as broad a spectrum of emotions as possible, but it's also just closer to real life. Sometimes your friends are going to make bad decisions. Sometimes they're going to need your help. And you have to learn when you need to intervene, even when it means provoking their ire. Sometimes that's what real friendship's about. Beyond that, Mustang's arc acknowledges the fact that people are complicated. They're not simply good or bad. It acknowledges the fact that sometimes the difference between good people and bad people is just a few bad decisions. And sometimes there's no difference at all. Beyond that, it challenges the audience to reevaluate their assumptions and their ethics, an act that any work should be applauded for doing. And beyond all that pretentious crap, it just makes it a much more powerful and memorable story. What should we learn from Mustang? Well, remember to make your characters complex, but those complexities have to be paced out. Remember that Mustang was like this the entire time that he was on screen. We just didn't always know about it. The order of trait reveal can drive the audience emotionally towards where you want them to be. It can also get them to reassess their own assumptions, and doing this forces them to think deeper about the work, which is going to make the work more memorable in people's minds, and also tends to build a more fervent fan base. Effectively pulling off morally gray characters is a task that will test and grow any writer. I plan on doing it myself, and hopefully I'll be halfway decent at it someday. And folks, that is going to wrap up our discussion of Roy Mustang. Oh, gosh, this video is hard to make. It's been a while. I have been out of practice. Uh, if you're new here, there are some videos on this channel that are worth watching that I've made before. You can check them out. Uh, not all of them are worth watching. This is a work in progress. This video itself, I think, was... Uh, it's pretty rough at uh, points uh, because, you know, again, we are ramping back up. There will be a lot more videos, I know, because they're shorter and will be faster to make than this one. But this is a big one, and I really thought it would, you know, I, if I was going to come back, I needed to come back with a bang and show everybody that, yeah, this is really happening. I'm, I'm going to make these videos, and they're going to get better, and eventually you might even like them. So... If you want to see that, stick around. I'm not going to give you any more spiel. I'm going to go get on making that next video, and y'all be good.